Hello and welcome to News Click. I am Paranjoy Guha Thakurta, and with me here I have economist Gurbachan Singh. Professor Gurbachan Singh teaches economics, and he is a member of the faculty. He is a member. He is a visiting member of the faculty of the Indian Statistical Institute in Delhi. And today we are going to discuss the state of India's economy. after covid the recession and what are the policy lessons that india could draw from the experiences of other countries thank you so much professor gurbachan singh for joining us uh, now the first question to you is we know that the indian economy is going to shrink india's national income or gross domestic product or gdp is expected to shrink now it has been slowing down for the last several years and now on account of the covid pandemic and the ongoing economic recession there is an expectation that india's economy could shrink or contract now the amount or the proportions vary some people say 4.5% others are saying 12.5% so there's quite a range what are your views what are your expectations to what extent do you uh, expect the indian economy to contract in the financial year that will end on the 31st of march 2021 so um, uh, so the estimates depend on the assumptions made and uh, the 4.5% um, estimate uh, was given by the imf and 12.5% is the estimate given by uh, dr pranav sen and uh, dr pranav sen made the assumption that if there are no further um, government expenditures uh, no further stimulus from the government then it could contract as far as 12.5% but subsequent to his uh, statement uh, there have been some more uh, fiscal stimulus in one form or another so going by the methodology of dr pranav sen it may not go as far as 12 and 1/2% but uh, it can be very significant it can be more than the imf estimate of 4 and 1/2% okay now you know how do you define recession the americans and the west defines recession as negative growth i mean that's a tautological phrase i mean the economy does not grow it actually shrinks for two successive quarters that means for a six month period but many people argue that what we are going to see is not just a recession but a deep recession perhaps something in the nature of a depression what are your views professor singh um that is uh, very true in fact um, at the time that the people were invoking the us definition here uh, the finance minister had said that uh, while the west is looking for a possible contraction i am talking about the earlier years before covid 19 and that time she said in our case only the growth rate has come down but it is still positive well beyond zero however post covid the situation has changed dramatically so uh, we are talking about uh, negative uh, growth rate and not just negative it is significantly negative so one could describe it as depression the only qualification that i will add there is that the usual notion of a depression is a prolonged phase as had happened in the 1930s here even though the contraction is going to be uh, very likely to be very large however uh, as of now the hope is that it is not going to be prolonged for several years so that is the saving grace Uh, now professor singh a lot of people say that what is bound to happen is that the fiscal deficit as a proportion of our gross domestic product is going to go up now instead of being at 3% or 3.5% it could go up to 7 7.5% now conventional wisdom says that you know uh, at if the fiscal deficit goes up that's not good it spurs uh, it, 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 there is inflationary that are inflationary pressures and this is uh, unsustainable but at a time like this when we are looking at a deep recession which we don't know how long it will last everybody irrespective of their 
ideology, left, right, center, all believe that the fiscal deficit must go. But so far, what the government has announced so far, in the, the so-called 20 lakh crore package of measures, and then that, that is coming to roughly 10% of India's gross domestic product, uh, what our GDP was, is projected to be, roughly 200 lakh crores. But the fiscal deficit, where do you see it going? And what are your views? I mean, how, I mean, can the, how, to what extent can the government really now, in a sense, effectively print notes to revive the economy? That the so-called Keynesian model of reviving the economy. Uh, firstly, that 10% of GDP is not fiscal stimulus, it is financial package. Now that financial package includes fiscal deficit, but it also includes lending by the banks uh, to the companies. So some people have estimated the true fiscal, uh, fiscal stimulus component of the financial package and that is not likely to be more than 1% of GDP. It's not 10% of GDP. The rest of the 9% is other uh, things. So one should bear that in mind. So what that means is that the implications for fiscal deficit are not uh, as huge as the figure of 10% uh, may suggest. The second thing here is that uh, while there is near consensus that there is a need for additional government spending, uh, there is a difference between additional government spending and deficit. So I also agree that the government needs to spend a lot more in this situation. However, uh, the deficit, the spending may be financed by borrowing or it may be financed by uh, some other measures. And it is these other measures which uh, I have written about at some length and I'll just briefly mention these here. So first is that the foreign exchange reserves are much larger than they need to be. So there is scope for reduction of foreign exchange reserves. Second, there is uh, excess land holding with the government, which uh, this is land which is not utilized. Uh, there, are, there is a study uh, which was done by Shubhashish Gangopadhyay at India Development Foundation and um, I should uh, give some figures here. So uh, 13 major port trusts have about 100,000 hectares. International Airport Authority of India has 20,400 hectares. The Ministry of Defence has 283,280 hectares. And the Indian railways have some 43,000 hectares, which were valued in 2016 at rupees 3 trillion. So the point of this is to say that uh, there are uh, places where the government uh, can tap and get uh, funds so that it can spend, which is indeed required. Okay. Professor Gurbachan saying, what about taxing the rich? Or as you rightly so, pointed out, it's not a 10 lakh crore package, but actually it, it could be really a 2 lakh crore or, or maybe a little more or a little less than that. But the short, is, short point is, this government seems to believe that the way it can revive the investments and the growth impulses in the economy and revive the economy is not by taxing the rich or as you have pointed out, utilizing the foreign currency reserves or the surplus land that are lying with various government authorities, but in privatizing, in privatizing all the public, the entire public sector, and even there is talk about privatizing the Indian railways. That seems to be the ideological, uh, the ideological driven agenda of this government. What are your comments? So, um, uh, Privatization can be an ideological matter and it may well be. However, I am not arguing for it as one of the measures in terms of any ideology. It's on the pure economics. As I said, the land is not utilized or underutilized, the excess land which 
the various government agencies have. And the foreign exchange reserves are huge and they earn very little money for the RBI. So in a sense, uh, when we hold foreign exchange reserves, we are lending to the government of the United States. Now imagine the situation. Why imagine this is what is happening? So what we have is a situation in which the uh, poor Indian uh, RBI and government of India are lending money to the US government at about 1% interest rate or even less uh, currently. So there is uh, good economics uh, behind that. But the um, uh, other part that you said, uh, where I, uh, where you have a very valid and very good interesting point, which is about taxation. Now, in India, we don't have an inheritance tax. We used to have wealth tax, which was abolished. Now, we have capitalist economies in the world, the United States, the European countries, which have both of these taxes in one way or another. And we are a mixed economy and we don't have either of these taxes. Now, it is this which needs to be tapped and it, this in us, this particular time could be a good time to impose or reintroduce such a tax because we are going through a crisis. If you are going through a crisis, then as a nation, we need to share with each other, which is to say that if there, are, if there aren't taxes that are in place, then they need to be imposed. I just add a little bit, people are objecting uh, to a higher income tax. That objection may be quite valid. However, what they are not saying is that there is no wealth tax or inheritance tax which is where there is scope. Professor Singh, you know, you have in your articles and your academic papers, you've talked about the experiences of other countries. You've talked about the experience of the United States, Europe, other developed countries. Now, what are there any lessons for India? I mean, India, does it have to follow the kind of examples of other countries in the world? I mean, what should be our own policies? What should be our own strategies? To revive investment, everybody knows that until and in, unless you revive investments and revive, revive consumption demand, there is no way that the Indian economy will improve. So uh, if you could briefly summarize uh, the experiences of other, uh, other countries, the lessons for, for India and what we need to do here in this country. So um, the important lessons that we have are from Japan which faced a very serious recession in the year 1989-1990. That's the time they also went through a big asset price crash. And uh, post that, they started what subsequently came to be called as quantitative easing. And they also moved in for large fiscal deficits and huge public debt. Somewhat similar policies were followed by the US after the global financial crisis and also by Europe uh, at least since 2012. Now, people argue that uh, Japan, US, Europe, all these countries have adopted uh, quantitative easing. They have gone for large public debt, and yet they have not had inflation or fiscal crisis. Having observed that, now people are saying that India currently is going through that severe contraction, uh, somewhat like depression, and so we should also follow similar policies. What people are forgetting is that Japan would never return to high growth rates. The growth rate in Europe is low. The US growth rate, though not as bad as uh, Japan and uh, Europe, it's still lower than what it was earlier. So while these policies restored macroeconomic stability, they ensured somewhat full employment or near full employment, where they had an adverse effect is on the growth rate. So it was not sustainable recovery and growth. So what the lesson is that we have to have policies which look at recovery, not just from the current situation, but it has to be a sustainable recovery and need to restore growth. So in that context, these policies are not appropriate. What we need to focus on is demand as you had in mind in one way or another that demand needs to be kept in mind however that demand can be in the form of consumption or investment from a humanitarian angle we need consumption demand because the poor are in a difficult uh, position currently 
they are in a difficult situation anyway. It's just got worse. So from that angle, consumption demand is required. However, from the viewpoint of sustainable recovery and growth, investment demand cannot be ignored. So there is a mix of consumption and investment that is required, an optimal mix. And if uh, there is a limit to how much the government can borrow or is willing to borrow, then some other uh, resources could be tapped in order to uh, push the consumption and investment. So you mentioned okay. just consumption and adding investment. All right. Uh, Professor Gurbachan Singh, you mentioned employment. Uh, we already had a situation for, for the last several years, actually. One could even argue for the last several decades. Growth had not led to job creation. I mean, it was not really labor intensive, our pattern of growth. I mean, we had actually jobless growth or close to jobless growth. Uh, after the lockdown began, according to the Center for Monitoring the Indian Economy, we had reached a, a unemployment reached record levels. One out of four persons in this country was unemployed. And, and uh, with the migrant, uh, the, the movement of migrants, the internal migration that took place that started uh, in, 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 in late March and continued right through May and June. I mean, what many believe, we, what we've witnessed in India in the recent past, is the biggest internal migration of its kind in the history of humankind. Even after the partition of, I mean, part, the partition of India and the experiences of other countries, we, we have far, far had that. I mean, uh, I mean, we can debate on how many crores of people have left. So under the situation, as you pointed out, the humanitarian aspect, providing food, providing essentials, the government does, I mean, what, what, what is, how, how do you sort of, uh, how do you evaluate the recent uh, experience of this country and what the government has done and what the government should have done after announcing a lockdown on the night of the 24th uh, of March, giving people a few hours, less than four hours? Yes. So I think here there is, this is more an issue of public administration rather than economics. And it is a case of mismanagement. It is a case of uh, administration that has not done well. The governance has been poor. The planning has been poor. Now, some of it one can understand because it was a very, very new situation. But then that was only in the very early stages. Uh, fortunately, in a sense, uh, we faced COVID after other countries had. So we had some lessons to draw from other countries. But what I want to say here is that uh, they, this is uh, more a failure of uh, public administration, uh, governance, um, which is the core function of the government and the central government and uh, several state governments. Uh, though some state governments have done better than uh, others, um, but it, it, this is not really so much uh, an issue of resource constraint. I would not say that. Oh, right. uh, the government of India is not so poor that it cannot afford uh, some spending on these issues. You have in fact pointed out that the government of India does indeed have fiscal space, broadly defined. And even if you take into account uh, uh, like laws like the FRBM Act, the Fiscal Responsibility and Budget Management Act, two questions. Uh, which was this act, which was enacted in 2003? Is it finally time to scrap the act altogether? And and secondly, how? I mean, if you believe the government does indeed have that space, that fiscal space, to increase spending on not just humanitarian uh, purposes, but most importantly, our completely broken healthcare system. I mean, we have been spending so little on our healthcare. That even now it seems whether whether I mean I wonder whether the government has woken up to the terrible situation that we are in and and the pathetically low public investment that is taking place in healthcare. Yeah. Let me uh, talk about the FRBM Act, Fiscal Responsibility and Budget Management Act, two thousand three. Now there was a reason that this was put in place, and uh, there were good reasons. And I am of the view that those reasons remain valid. This is not to say that the government should not spend more. Don't get me wrong, please. 
I am saying the, gov the government should not scrap this act, but it should spend. And it should finance that spending through reduction of foreign exchange reserves, sale of excess land, and some disinvestment, given the crisis situation that we have. And also because there is an economic underutilization of the resources. And now, the reason why I am saying the FRBM Act should not be scrapped, uh, and many people have a rather wrong conception on that, let me clarify that first. What people are arguing is that 3.5% uh, fiscal deficit uh, is, a, is something that works for US, Europe, so it's something that works for India. Now, there is a basic difference between the two cases. In Europe, in Japan, in the US, the tax to GDP ratio is much higher than it is in India. Now, because the tax to GDP ratio is much higher than uh, that in India, the comparison becomes very lopsided. So what I mean by that is that if it's 3.5% fiscal deficit in say Europe, then that translates to some percentage of fiscal deficit as a proportion of the tax revenues. Now, when we come to the Indian case, the 3.5% fiscal deficit can mean a very large percentage of tax revenues. So just to give you some uh, number, a sense of the numbers. So, so it's something like 35%. If you take the deficit, if you take the fiscal deficit in India as a proportion of the tax revenues of the government of India, then it's about one third or thereabout. I don't remember the exact number, but it is that very high. That is not the situation in US, Europe, Japan. So what I want to say is that the fiscal situation is really bad. Let me give you another figure. The interest payments are about one third of the total expenditures in India at the central government. That's a huge figure. What I want to say is that the fiscal situation is not good and it is in this context then one is saying that the FRBM Act should not be scrapped. However, given the COVID crisis, given the recession or near depression situation that we have, the government should spend, but it should spend out of foreign exchange reserves, excess land, uh, public sector undertakings and uh, that kind of uh, that kind of stuff. Okay. Thank you very much, Professor Gurbachan Singh, for sharing your views you. with the viewers of Newsquake and keep watching Newsquake.